The financial services industry plays a major role in the economy of any country and can create significant impact on various scales and on different levels of society, eradicating poverty, promoting gender equality, combating HIV and AIDS and ensuring environmental sustainability are four of the eight United Nations Millennium Development Goals. In this episode of It's Africa's Time, we look at the interventions of three financial services institutions and their contributions to these goals. Much of Africa has seen quite high economic growth rates uh, in recent years, but that high growth hasn't translated into greater food security uh, or in many cases into much poverty reduction. The trick is to make the growth much more inclusive, to focus on where the poor are actually living and working, which is so often in the rural sectors, and also to focus on building up the micro businesses and opportunities for the small business people to get into the bigger value chains. I can think of a number of examples where UNDP has been using its convening power to bring governments, uh, businesses, including international business, and smallholder farmer associations in efforts to really promote sustainable business ventures. So I find that kind of work which UNDP is doing around sustainable business very exciting. No one actor can achieve the MDGs or take development all the way to lift people from least developed country status to middle income country status uh, to going all the way to, to graduation. So it means governments working with stakeholders in their own societies. That includes business, includes communities, includes local government, it includes the civil society organisations. And the development partners, we have to work together. If we work together, that strong partnership will achieve far more than if each of us tried to work on our own. Two thirds of the 23.5 million people in the world living with HIV, including 91% of the world's HIV positive children, live in sub Saharan Africa. In 2011, a further estimated 1.7 million people in the region became newly infected. The Sunlam Foundation, together with Regency Foundation Networks and the KZN Department of Education, has entered the second year of the HIV and Me Community Education Partnership in the Kwamashu and Umlazi districts of Durban. This partnership has facilitated the implementation of HIV and Me in 20 senior schools in these districts, working with school management, educators and learners. The intervention is also extended to the parent community through the Family Support Programme, providing a holistic approach to HIV and AIDS education and management through the collaborative engagement of all partners and stakeholders. Partnering for Better South Africa, we looked at Regency Foundation and the work that has been done. The HIV and Me program stood out because of the results shown, statistics show that they are making headway and that's the reason for going with this particular project in the KZN area. Education is the key focus within the Sunlam Foundation and HIV and AIDS education is merely one of these uh, sub-focus areas in that particular space. Right. So as a financial services company, we believe that it's core that we actually have healthy policyholders and a healthy generation to come. The project has worked exceptionally well and has been very successful in the Durban area. And as a result, we plan to replicate this project in the Limpopo area as well. Uh, the way we run the HIV and Me program at the schools is myself, the facilitator, I go to the school and I train the educators themselves. And I train the educators as though they are learners. So they get to experience exactly what it is the learners would experience in class. Then we have what we call a co-teach where I come in the following week and I observe and assist the educator 
practically implementing one of our lessons in the classroom so that they get a feel of what it's like to facilitate the information but also what it's like to receive the responses that come from their learners. Then once the co-teacher is done, I leave the school and I leave the program and the information in the hands of the school. So it's self-sustainable in that way. And then of course there's a process of monitoring and continuous uh, motivation that we give the school. The HIV and Me program has benefited the school in that it's brought the reality of HIV home in a very non-threatening way to the young people. It's also allowed them to take stock of their own understandings, the non-understandings, the misunderstanding, and also to engage with HIV and how easy it is for them to become HIV positive. The educators had great fun with the HIV and Me training program. And this was because the facilitators were so well prepared. With the facilitators, they were able to interrogate all the aspects that came to them. And what the facilitators did was, in a very friendly way, brought new information to teachers who had no knowledge of information that was critical to the teaching of HIV. The learners love the HIV and Me program for various reasons. One is the aspect where they get to participate in the lesson. So they're not sitting down and there's someone in the front lecturing them uh, about HIV and AIDS, but they get to actively participate and ask questions and give answers. The educator does very little in the classroom. They are just the facilitator. We cover the biomedical aspect of HIV and AIDS, so we train uh, the educators and the learners and we give them the information they need about HIV and AIDS and how it affects the body and the immune system on a cellular level. And then we've got the psychosocial aspect where we give them skills uh, that they can apply uh, to their everyday life to change their behaviors. So we don't just focus on knowledge, but it's the application of that knowledge once you have it in order to change your behaviors that result in HIV infection. Tell me what it was about the HIV and Me program that you enjoyed most. It was really fun. It helped bring awareness of HIV and AIDS in a different way, other than watching television or reading a newspaper, but you get to do an activity where you can learn from it. I feel the HIV and AIDS uh, program at school is important because teenagers are at a high risk of getting HIV and AIDS because they're exposed to uh, unsafe sex and being teenagers they want to try and experiment new and different things and unsafe sex is one of them. So by being exposed to this, it will teach us and show us the outcomes of getting HIV and AIDS. Our parents and grandparents do not go to school because they had to go work for some kind of income because things uh, back then wasn't uh, good because of apartheid and stuff. So uh, going back home and talking to our parents about what we're learning in school is very important. Having the HIV and Me program at school allows me to have the effect of going home and educating my younger brothers and sisters as well as my cousins on the HIV and AIDS. Also what's been for me I think a significant and critical moment, I've had learners who felt comfortable enough to come and share with me their concerns about their HIV status because they are sexually active. I've had learners who are pregnant, uh, one who is positive, who came to share with me and to talk with me and it's allowed for us then to look at what the situation requires, the need for medications, how we can work with the learner, for the learner to know nobody's judging them and that's what's so great. The HIV and Me project doesn't stop at learner level but aims to integrate the entire family and as many members of the community as possible. Zanele Ntama works for a Department of Health Ketempilo Clinic. She's also a facilitator for the HIV and Me family support programs run in KZN. The prevalence of HIV and AIDS in KwaZulu-Natal is currently sitting at 39.5%. The HIV and AIDS program that I'm running is empowering the parents as well as the children. Empower the women with information because if you don't have information that then you are not in a position to create any awareness or you are not in a position to talk about any disclosure. We look 
looking at a deliberate attempt to transform society. In doing so, we need to create awareness with the youth regarding HIV and AIDS. Subsistence and small-scale farming can help alleviate poverty and create employment. The Swelopela project, which means moving ahead in Setswana, is funded by the insurer Mutual and Federal and is the first agricultural socio-economic development project of this nature undertaken by the company. This three-year investment was established on three hectares of land donated by the Becker Agricultural Boarding School with the aim of providing additional employment and fresh produce to the dependents of their staff members. The project was initiated in August 2011 and the farm launched in May 2012. The project manager Copano Labete and farm manager Sintle Matlope are now working closely on the secondary phases of development. Kapana, thanks for showing us around today. Can you tell us what has been achieved during the initial phases of this project? So, the farming project phase one um, has really involved, you know, us getting basics into place. This project is actually a community project um, and there's two parts to the community project towards food security. The one part is around the commercial element where we'd be selling the fresh produce and the other part is to make sure that we do uh, distribute uh, fresh produce to all the 55 households that form up the community here at Becker High School. We had to put in place over 400 meters of piping um, just to ease up on the water supply. Over and above that, we have uh, erected a farm shed, brick and mortar. In this very farm shed, we keep our tools, our tractors. Come harvesting time, this is where we prepare our vegetables for the marketplace. We had to do a lot of work to get it to where it is right now. We had to you know, root out the wheat, a lot of work, labor. Um, after we did that, we got a large tractor from Becker High School to prepare farmland. And after that, we then got our mini tractors to do the rest of the work. Becker High School's support has really been instrumental to the birth of this project. They donated land. Also, they donated the tunnel, which we use as a nursery. Plus, they donated the chicken broiler. The school contributed to the project in quite a vast extent by supplying them with some knowledge as far as the office is concerned. We also borrow them some of our equipment and we also are involved in some advice during planting, harvesting, etc. The first crop surpassed expectation with an excess of 11,000 cabbages. This meant that the farm could start to supply the Johannesburg fresh produce market and thereafter reinvest profits towards further growth. A farm manager was contracted externally and the next stages of development have commenced. The first of these developments includes the implementation of a stable commercial broiler production, which was successfully trialled during the initial project phase. Further, in addition to the spinach and cabbage crop, carrots, onions, sweet potato and beetroot will be introduced and commercialised. What's more, the households of the Becker School staff members will each receive a plot to start their own food garden, but will still be provided with complementary vegetables and chicken from the main farm after this subsistence farming stage has begun. One of the parts to the whole farmland area um, includes 55 household mini plots. Each of these mini plots is 16 square meters big, and every single household will choose out of six crops which four they'll go with. We'll give them supply of those seedlings, one, we'll give them water, we'll give them all the tools that they need. All that they need to do is to come and look after their farm land. The plots that are donated to our households will be planted and then we'll look after them since they are giving us the food and we are very privileged. The criteria we looked at when considering this project is it's a real grassroots project, a socio-economic development opportunity that links very closely with our business objectives. As the largest agricultural assets insurer in the country, we obviously have a great interest in the agricultural sector. We work very closely with Becker Schools, so this was an opportunity for an integrated program and it's worked extremely well. Um, with the community in the area, with ourselves and with Becker Schools. On an ongoing basis, we're going to have a new team every year. 
Uh, by so doing, we'd be giving every single household an opportunity for a dependence from those households to be part of the project. Every time we do have work, whether we're cleaning or we're painting or harvesting time, we do get to hire people from the community to assist us with the harvesting. Before this project, the general situation was, as far as the staff members concerned, was not very good uh, because there was no activities for them. And with the project, it brought some activities as the members started getting involved in the operations as far as plowing is concerned, planting and harvesting. And in general, I think that the living conditions of the general assistance uh, also improved quite a lot. At the end of the day, we would like them to be self-sustainable to produce for them as families as well as for the market. We sell vegetables to the Joburg Fresh Produce Market. We've already gotten some sales uh, from chicken sales um, as well as from the actual vegetables. After three years, we'll then see how much money has already been raised. Um, if it's enough for two-year cash flow, that's when we'll know that we're ready for a handover to the community. Uh, my dream is to see it being a commercial project one day. People and planet and particularly profits are almost, I suppose you can't say three sides of the same coin, but it has some kind of concomitant relationship in how we unpack the people issues. Many people in Africa are rural. Africa itself is underdeveloped. New African businesses are bringing electricity, bringing roads, bringing health services, bringing with their profits, obviously, uh, using that for good and to change the lives of, of many people. Profit then in, is intrinsically linked to making all of these things work because you can't do this just as a charity. And people in Africa are not asking for aid. They're asking for profits which is made from their, their country to be ploughed back into the necessary components to make it sustain itself. Instead of taking the resource and sending it to another country and it comes back as a finished product. So Africa, within the new economic framework, has undergone tremendous change. And of course, it has to do with the multi-party democracy or the winds of change that are blowing through Africa. And the UN, you know, you know, three cheers must go out to them. They're forcing companies to behave in a certain way. Established in 1940, the Industrial Development Corporation is a national development finance institution set up to promote economic growth and industrial development. It's owned by the South African government under the supervision of the Economic Development Department. The IDC's objectives are to contribute to the creation of balanced, sustainable economic growth in South Africa and on the rest of the continent. It makes funds available to industries or companies with plans to increase their competitiveness whilst engaging in sustainable business practices. We're here near the small town of Atavi in the northern part of Namibia to visit a newly founded company who is supported by an industrial loan from the IDC. They are the sole cement producer in the country and by far the largest employer in the region. This was a greenfield plant. Here was nothing. We only had bush. There was not even a road, there was not electricity. We started in 2009 and Trink, through their expertise, did various uh, investigations and also a very detailed environmental impact assessment study. IDC has a 20% stakeholding in Ohorongo Cement and certainly institutions, especially the IDC, for us are very important, that has a long-term investment philosophy of building new industries in the region. From the raw material until the final product, everything comes out of the country. And I think that is very unique about Ohorongo. We have limestone, shale, marl, iron ore and gypsum. The advantages of producing locally are multiple. First of all, we are getting less dependent on imports. We are now locally manufacturing for the local market, plus also exporting to some of the neighboring countries and not only the direct job creation but also the indirect job creation through outsourcing opportunities, through procurement opportunities, not importing for example protective clothing from overseas but producing it locally and also job creation through downstream activities. So these are in very short certainly very important advantages not only for Orongo but also for the economy at large for Namibia. 
order to achieve the right quality of cement, you must follow certain process steps. Only to mention some of them, you must crush the raw materials, you must grind them, you must burn them to clinker, and you must grind the clinker to get cement. Orongo Cement is the most CO2 efficient cement producer in the world. The drives at the plant are highly efficient and are managed by variable speed control systems to keep energy consumption to a minimum. Filters and compressed air systems are centrally controlled and the cement mills, which are the plant's highest energy consumers, are only run during the night to relieve the Namibian power grid during peak consumption. On the thermal energy side, the kiln employs the latest technology, which reuses most of the heat from the gases to dry raw material and coal before releasing it back into the environment. Water is another very important aspect in terms of environmental impacts. We are not using water for cooling purposes here on site. We are using air. We are squeezing the hot gases with ambient air. That saves every day up to 220 cubic meters of fresh water. The cement plant you see is currently running on maximum capacity. You don't see coming out anywhere dust. The reason, the background is that we have more than 40 backhouse filters installed all over the plant. At any point where we charge material to another process step, we are de-dusting this change over. And therefore, we can run the plant with a very little dust emissions, which are far below 5 milligrams per non cubic meters. Tell us about your connection with Energy for Future. Energy for Future is one reason for our high efficiency on the thermal energy side. We are replacing fossil fuels, currently coal, with wood chips from our sister company, Energy for Future. The Bush to Fuel project is about cutting encroacher bushes, which has taken over the savannas here in Namibia. In total, 26 million hectares are bush encroached. That's similar the size of the United Kingdom, so it's a very big area we are talking about. And we are cutting these bushes selectively, meaning we are leaving out all uh, protected species that are protected under the Forest Act, plus we are leaving all trees and plants above four meters since they are providing shade for game and cattle. So we are increasing biodiversity. We are opening up the farm. Uh, grass will recently grow here again so the farmer can stock more cattle and more game. All in all, it's a big benefit not only for the environment, also for the farmer. Orongo Cement is using these wood chips to substitute the coal, so we are reducing fossil CO2 emissions in total about 130,000 tons of fossil CO2 per year with that uh, wood. Last but not least, also Namibia is benefiting because we can use, we can utilize here an own energy source. How does a small town like Otavi benefit from housing a major international industry? It has put Otavi on the map, especially with the central government. As a small town, to host a major industry like Orongo Cement. In the first instance, uh, we benefit from our people getting the jobs. And as a municipality, we benefit from those people paying for their rents, rates and taxes. The motto of the Orongo Trust is together we will grow from a village to a town. The trust was started during the early phases of the plant's construction and is based on three pillars of engagement, sports and education, healthcare and infrastructure. With the support of a German NGO, the Trust's first project involved the upgrade and provision of equipment to Otavi's medical clinic. Additional medical equipment to the value of 2.3 million Namibian dollars was also donated to the National Ministry of Health for use in other Namibian hospitals. Can you give me some examples of contributions the Trust has already made in your town? The Trust have contributed towards the renovation of the state clinic. Secondly, the Orongo Trust has contributed towards the solar panels at one of these hostels here in town. And thirdly, it has also contributed towards renovating our sports facilities. One of the IDC's key objectives is the development of Africa through support of sustainable projects with significant development impact. 
as an extension of the socio-economic role, investment in ventures like Orongo Cement include an increasing emphasis on environmental sustainability as part of the core business strategy. Following this trend, the IDC launched the Green Energy Efficiency Fund in 2011. The GIF is a 500 million rand fund which seeks to promote energy efficiency and self-use renewable energy projects, primarily within the energy-intensive industrial sectors in southern Africa. The energy savings achieved will facilitate the full cost of the loan. This fund forms part of a larger plan to disperse some 25 billion rand in support of green economic development over the next five years. 20% of this fund has already been allocated to projects ranging from textiles and food processing to solar panels and biogas production. Thanks for being with us on It's Africa's Time. Please join us next month as we look at companies acting as agents of change across the continent.